Um, so like you, you heard, my name is Gerald. My name is Gerald Green. Um, and I'd like to say before I start, um, I'm definitely nervous, uh, but I'm also excited to talk about uh, myself and my, just my individual being living in this world. Uh, originally, uh, I'm from Las Vegas, Nevada, born and raised. Um, I've lived all over the United States. I've, I've been in multiple different places, multiple different cultures, seen a lot of different people that look like me. I've been in places where I don't have a lot of people that look like me, like Ashlyn. Uh, so I'm, I'm coming with this discussion today from multiple different realms. So I want you to understand that first, that I'm talking from a place of acceptance and from knowledge from different areas. Uh, I'm first going to talk about just my first experience with racism. Um, and for me, the first experiences with racism um, were actually in my own household, um, or my own family. Uh, my grandparents are... They're, they're pretty racist. They're, they're aligned with the, I guess, the conservative side, which we kind of throw on the, the racism end, but I'm not going to get political here. Um, and, you know, growing up younger, it's just, it's small little comments about hair, skin, how I look so happy, um, you know, little, little microaggressions, things that, I, that are thrown at me. Um, how I felt being younger when, when they would say things like that, um, I can say for sure it was, it was anger, um, was the, the overlying emotion that came along with, with times like this. Um, and also, and also a piece of embarrassment almost to be a different skin color than them, which I obviously over time figured out, um, isn't the right way to think, but, um, what did I really do with that? Those, those emotions, um, back then I internalized them. I, I held them within myself, just like a lot of other individuals who look like me. Um, we internalize that anger, that fear, that uncomfortability, and then we shut ourselves out to the rest of the world, uh, which is what you see a lot going on nowadays. People don't know how to handle their emotions and you know, accurately say out what they feel. Um, was anybody there for me is the next question I had on the list. Um, and that's... Yes, somebody was there for me, but not in the capacity essentially that I needed, if that makes sense. Um, I, I didn't grow up with a father in my life. Um, he, uh, it's, it's whatever his choice, made that choice. I grew up with a very strong mother household. Uh, she raised me and my sister by ourselves. I actually brought a picture of her because I wanted y'all to see the two most important people in the world to me um, right here. So this is my mother right here, Lorraine Huntsucker, and you can tell I'm shaking because I'm nervous, but let's just get over the nerves. Boom, that's my mom, and that's my sister. This is Lorraine, this is Alicia. Um, and my mom, she is essentially the, 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 the strongest woman I've ever met in my life. Um, one second, one second. Um, she's the strongest woman I've ever met in my life. Um, and she's made, she's made me see how, how strong one individual can be in this world, no matter what it's thrown at them, no matter what their upbringing is, um, no matter what you know, significant others tell them. She, she's shown me so much strength, and that's why I am the way I am nowadays, uh, today, not nowadays. Um, what, what was I gonna talk about? Like my father, like I said, my mom, she raised me and my sister alone. Um, so she has the strength of probably five fathers, five dads. Um, so I, I had to add that piece in there because to get a little, to know a little bit about me, I kind of fit within the stereotypical realms of both sides. Like I didn't grow up with my father, which is stereotypical to most black families. Uh, what one in three households grow up without a father, black, black households grow up without a father. So I have an understanding of the trauma of what a lot of my black, my black brothers and sisters go through. So I can talk in open spaces and educate people from a place of understanding um, for, as, because I've gone through the experience. Um, but yeah, I, I'm, uh, I'm just, I'm proud of those two women for who they are, who they become, how, how my mom's raised me in this world to, to, to be who I am. But I will say um, it was around 18 years old when, um, 
truly I say I transformed in the man that I am today to be able to talk to y'all about this type of stuff is when me and my mom, I got kicked out of my mom's house at 18 um, over some stuff that doesn't need to be brought up right now. But um, when I got kicked out, it was just the conversation that I had with my mom about the lack of empathy that I felt from her. And, and what I see nowadays, well, not nowadays, it's been going on for years. There's just lack of empathy for other people's situations, lack of understanding for other people's situations, people not trying to understand other people's situations. It's, it's a word that I heard um, or a term that I heard called willful ignorance. Um, you choosing not to educate yourself about the other side. Um, and when I told my mom that, she, she took a step back. I think it was transformative for her and it was also for me because when I said that, I got to see how, how much emotion it evoked on her to have somebody tell her they, her own son, that I felt like she wasn't accepting some of the, the plights that I was going through, some of the issues that I was going through, just not having empathy from my side. Um, and I can say when I did do that, and that was right before I went to college too, um, which is crazy. Um, having that transformative moment with my mother allowed me to change myself because I can't, I can't ask my own mother, my own kin, to be more empathetic and me go out in the world and be just the same exact type of individual. So I had to be the change that I wanted to see in the world. So if I wanted more empathy, I had to give more empathy, which is where I, I kind of saw a shift within my own mindset. So it gave me, throughout these, these past five years of educating myself, going to school, it gave me a more open mindset to learn about things, to to be able to educate myself about stuff. And I'm still to this day, I have unconscious bias um, about things that I, I you know, they're, un, they're you don't know them. But I think it's the mindset that I carry trying to educate myself that I'm not right all the time. I'm definitely not right all the time. I only know what I know, but I also can educate myself and learn more about other things. Um, and being able to admit that you're wrong is one of the best things that any individual can do. Um, and really that, that whole situation with my mom is, I had to start at home because first, the place uh, we learn these things is where you have to go back and correct. So some of the things that I learned through life, maybe being less empathetic and stuff, I had to go back and correct it. And I didn't know it at the time, but I did know it today. Talking to my coworker, she kind of put it in, in thought for me. Um, and the reason why that is so hard to do is because going back in your own household and trying to educate the people that are closest to you becomes the greatest risk because you spend time around these individuals daily. You, you, you know, you see them all the time. You don't want to have the animosity between people, but sometimes the animosity is necessary. You have to be comfortable with being uncomfortable. And I'm not saying anything here that you probably haven't heard over the past three months being in COVID, being in uh, quarantine, but we all have to get comfortable with being uncomfortable. It's simple as it goes. It's the same type of stuff I learned playing football. You know, we go, we go through drills and stuff. We have to learn to get un be uncomfortable. You have to, because the game is never going to go the way you want it to, just like life never goes the way you want it to. So we have to learn to change and adapt. Um, I actually wanted to talk about, because I, I wrote up a whole thing about uh, implicit bias, um, but I kind of, once I, I got to today on, on the day of actually having the talk, I, I was trying to focus more on macro ideas, bigger things that affect all types of individuals, no matter if you're black, um, just all types of disenfranchised individuals. But um, like I, I just did, I tried to more focus on the micro because the micro is the macro. Thank you, Luis, for giving me that quote today. Um, and the, the micro, it, it, the small stuff really means something. But um, implicit bias, let's just go ahead and educate people if, if, because I don't think everybody in here knows. I'm not going to assume everybody in here knows what implicit bias is. Um, it's known as social cognition. It refers to attitudes, stereotypes that affect our understanding and actions and decisions in an unconscious matter. So like I said, you don't, you can't just pinpoint them and pick them out every single time you see it because it's not accessible through introspection. You have to have somebody point it out to you and say that's wrong and then have discussions and understand why what you're saying is wrong. And uh, a quote yesterday, it's leaving my mind right now, but it was somewhat along the lines of, just because you don't understand why it's offensive, 
does not mean it's not offensive, if that makes sense. So if somebody tells you something is offensive and you, you, your immediate reaction is an emotional one, a step back, like, why is that offensive to you? Then you should, that is a trigger warning for yourself as a human being to try to understand why it's offensive to that person, if that makes logical sense. Um, let me go ahead and go down here. Um, and it, just, these are just a few key characteristics of implicit biases. Um, implicit biases are pervasive. Everyone possesses them, even people with avowed commitments to impartial, uh, impartial, impartiality, whatever, uh, such as judges. So like judges are supposed to be impartial, 100% impartial, no judgment, I don't have these sides. But implicit bias still lies within their brains, regardless if they think so or not. Um, implicit and explicit biases are related and explicit biases are biases you know. These are things like stereotypes that you know. Um, they, are, they are related, um, but distinct mental constructs. They are not mutually exclusive, and they may reinforce each other. So they play off each other, each of the, the, the explicit or implicit and explicit biases. Um, we generally tend to hold our implicit biases that favor our own in-group, um, though research has shown that we can still hold implicit biases against our end groups, so the groups that we're around, right? Um, so for example, like I'm, bi I'm black, black-skinned, um, I tend to focus on the, the implicit biases that affect black people, but it doesn't mean that there's not implicit biases that affect other groups, that makes sense. Um, and implicit biases are malleable. Our brains are inc incredibly complex and implicit associations that we have um, form can be gradually unlearned. So like I said, they're unconscious. What you learn, you can unlearn. So if somebody points something out to you, you have to keep constantly reminding yourself over time that this is not what somebody, is. I may offend somebody by saying this. I may offend somebody by doing this. Um, and really that's, that's right there is the biggest piece to change. It starts with you, the individual. Um, and that's what's not being spread out. We're not focusing on individual change. We're trying to focus on, you know, the media expresses these things and puts all this stuff in our face, tries to convolute the whole discussion. But overall, with this whole movement, the Black Lives Matter movement, everything, what we're trying to do is we're trying to change individual perception. We need individuals to start looking at themselves and how they act and start finding ways to change simple things. It's, it's simple things, it's daily, it's getting up, it's habitual, right? It's, it's crazy as I'm sitting here talking to y'all, I'm, I'm relating so much of this back to football. Um, you know, I've always known that football was a huge part of my life and I didn't even talk about my football background. I played football at Southern Oregon University right down the road here. Um, I played at a junior college a few years before that. Um, I've, been, I've been around great coaches, I've been around bad coaches. Um, it's, just, it's just crazy how much stuff crosses over because you learn so many lessons in football that you can take to life, but it's, it's only till you get in those moments where those lessons apply themselves that you start to realize how much those lessons mattered. Um, I'm, I'm, like I said, I, I, I wanted to focus on macro stuff, but now I'm trying to dive into micro stuff. Um, Jamie, I'm not too sure if there's much more that I can add in the discussion because now I just wanna, I wanna talk to y'all. I wanna see if what I said, if anything I said today, if it resonates in your heart, if you have anything to say off what I say, if there's anything else you want to talk about that maybe I could posit some educated information to. Um, I'm opening up now for discussion. I'm, I'm fine to do that now, Jamie. All right. Okay. I'm in a different room now. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. The whole computer crashed over there right when we we're having a discussion. Okay. Isn't that perfect? All right. Shoot it. Okay, so uh, Kelsey put my question into the chat if everybody wants to see it. It says, when people say to you, all lives matter, what's with the BLM stuff? How do you respond, Gerald? So when people say all lives matter, is that what you asked? I could barely hear yeah. click this again. A lot of people will respond to black lives matter by saying all lives matter. So how do you, as a black biracial male in this town, right. respond to that? I say, of course they do. But that's not the focus right now. Um, for so long, black lives, obviously by the actions, um, choices of m individuals in this, this nation, they, they haven't mattered. Um, we could talk about 
just saying, you know, action, actions speak louder than words, right? We've all heard that, that same exact saying. And I think we've seen over time that black people's lives have not been valued the way that other individuals in this nation's lives have been valued. If that makes sense, Louise. Thank you. Absolutely. Let me read some of these because we got a few in here. Exactly. That's exactly true right there. In, for, in order for all lives to matter, black lives have to matter. Simple as that. Let me go up here. What can Ashlanders do? And this is from Joyce Ward. What can Ashlanders do living in a, uh, such a white community um, and being far away from places where racism is created, creating a big problem? Um, Joyce, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to attack your question first off. Um, racism is just essentially, I feel like I'm not trying to attack you. I'm, I'm just a addressing the question because I think it might be um, there's some stuff and it might be not posited the right way. So um, I think racism is essentially just created in the household. It's by education. So especially a place like this, knowing the, the history of Ashland, knowing the history of the Rogue Valley um, and the history of Oregon in general, uh, being a very white state, um, I think we have to start educating our white individuals on more of the other side of the, you know, other skin individuals, dark black and brown skin individuals. And a place like Ashland is a fantastic place because it's almost a utopia where you only see individuals who look white skinned. Um, most of the people out here are black or brown are what they work at a taco truck or they play sports, just being, um, just being blunt. Um, but I feel like addressing racism in the household in Ashland. Um, and also we can have more representation downtown. We can talk about all that stuff, but it starts with education. We have to start educating our youth because that's where the world is gonna change. Uh, most of us here in this chat talking right now are we're past the point where we can, you know, make a whole lot of meaningful change within the world, but you can't still. But if you educate our youth, we can change the world by educating the, those younger and making better individuals for the next generations. Um, and that's one of the biggest pieces I told Jamie is the reason why I'm talking, is the reason why I'm even speaking is this topic, I do not have a choice to speak on anymore. I have an obligation. Um, and this is for my, my future generations. I want my children to grow up in a world where they don't feel bias just based on how they look. Simple as that. I want my kids to feel just like everybody else does growing up not having little slick slide comments thrown at them, knocking down their race, if that makes sense. So um, I, hope I, I hope I addressed your, your question. Um, I tried my best, but if I didn't do it, you can come in and talk to me at the Y if you want to talk more about it. I'm, I'm, I'm great to do that. Um, let's go down here. I'm white and 76 and had lived and worked in civil rights organizations before moving to Ashland. Where do I go to share my life experiences while continuing to learn and grow? That's from Vicky. Uh, that's, that's hard, especially being in Ashland. There's it's not a lot of safe spaces, not, not safe spaces, not a lot of spaces for individuals who kind of align with that, that I know of. Um, I can say Luis, she's not, she's not talking today, but she's, uh, she's been active within the communities that she's been in for, years now um, and she's just an inspiration to me working with her so um, if you get the opportunity i would definitely kind of connect with her she might have more resources than me of organizations as far as that goes um, i've had a few members come in and talk to me about websites um, we have the black student unit at uh, um, black student union at sou um, which is a great resource for students um, people my age but um, resources outside of that I can't say, I, I can say I'm ignorant to them. I don't know very many resources, just being honest with you. Oh, let me scroll down here. All right, another question from Luis. How do you feel about the saying, all right, how do you feel about the Say Their Names Memorial? Um, and what's my experience on that, my experience on that? Um, the Say Their Names Memorial. I don't know if uh, everybody here has gone and had a chance to go see the Say Their Names Memorial down there on A Street. Uh, I think that's where it's at, yeah, A Street. Um, it's just shirts with names of individuals who have been brutally killed by police officers. 
let's put it plain and simple, um, and have not had justice um, for their deaths. Um, how do I feel about it? I'm, I can say that is something that's, I, I'm extremely proud to see being out here um, in Ashland, you know, knowing the history, knowing all that, just seeing something like that put up, um, just to educate the, the members of the Ashland community, <laughs> simply. Um, it's just great to see because I feel like, like I said, we live in this somewhat utopia. We're separated from a lot of places being so far here in Ashland, Southern Oregon. Um, bringing something like that to light and maybe putting, putting the names up and people walking past like, who is this? Who is this? Then they can go home and educate themselves about them and learn about them. It's just, it's, it's a blessing to see something like that because that's exactly what I think I'm sitting here and trying to vocalize. Um, it's just education. Uh, representation people need to their stories need to be told um and we need to start changing the the focus that the media is putting on all these protesting stuff and putting it on the lives of these people who have lost um who have essentially just lost their lives due to lack of education lack of judgment i can't put it in a place why these police officers would kill these people um but the fact that it's happened just based off the simple things that they got killed for is, is not justifiable. So um, I'm happy to see it. Um, I hope there's more that comes out of it. I hope that members of the Ashton community continue to educate themselves. Um, Cause we, like, like you said earlier, um, Joyce, if, if I'm not wrong about the name, um, we live in such a white community. Um, so being able to put something up like that to educate people on the other side, which dialogue is a huge thing, um, it's just great to see. I love hearing about your mother, Gerald. I recently, oh, let me read out loud. I, I don't know why I'm whispering. Um, Priscilla said, I love hearing about your mother, Gerald. I recently had a, a Medium post titled, Stop Calling Black Women Strong. It's really, it's really got me thinking. I have such admiration for strong black women, but has it become almost a stereotype now? Maybe there's an assumption that black women have to be strong and can't show their vulnerabilities and softer side. That's beautiful what you just wrote there, wrote there Priscilla. Um, that's absolutely true. It's, it's been sensationalized, um, you know, the strong black woman in the black household. But like I, I stated earlier about the, you know, the statistical wise, statistic wise, um, one in three fathers aren't in a household in black communities. Um, so it, it has been sensationalized. I think that's definitely a stereotype. It's a, it's a, um, it's not implicit. It's, um, it's not the implicit one. It's the other bias, um, explicit bias. It's an explicit bias. We know that these things are a stereotype. Um, when you, when you say change, can you elaborate what that means in your eyes? When I say change about what, say that again after uh, Jay Burrow. Um, but like I said, the 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 assumption that all black or stop saying black women on the assumption that's placed on top of it that they have to be strong um, is definitely something that I've I've seen growing up in my 24 years. Um, all of my my black friends' moms are you know the, the comments they get you're so strong you're so you know we we, we know but. Um, they can't show their vulnerabilities and softer side. I definitely think that's been per set, uh, per perpetuated through time. Um, and um, the only way really to change things like that, I, maybe that's what you're asking, um, Jay Burrow, is about change. Um, change within the black community itself, if, that, if that's what you're asking. Um, I actually want to pull up right quick. Um, if I can find my phone for y'all, I'm going to pull up and talk about the the Black Panthers, um, which, you know, when we think about stereotypically the Black Panthers, um, the Black Panther, we think about like these negative stereotypes, like they were mil like a militia, they were combative against people. Um, but I can talk about their, their, their 10, their 10 uh, point program that they outlined. And this was actually created in 1967. Um, by uh, let me find their two names because I don't want to I don't want to take people's names out of it because they need their due credit. Everybody needs their credit. Um, I'll find it later and I'll give it to y'all. But the uh, the fifth um, the first rule that they they wrote out 
um, is we believe that black people will not be free until we are able to determine our own destiny. Um, so I think that might be along with what you're asking Jay Burrow about change. Um, within the black community, we have to find change within our own self because it starts with the self, right? Just like I, I asked, um, I, I talked about earlier about the, the, the self, it starts with the self. Um, within the black community, there's a lot of, there's a lot of self degradation. There's a lot of things that we do to our own community that we, you know, the social construct has enforced over time that are implicitly not understood, like they're not understood by the black community, how they're, they're negatively affecting us, right? If that makes logical sense. So um, I see things like that, the, the stereotypical side about the black women. There you go, Bobby Seal and Huey Newton. Thank you. I appreciate it, Vicky. Um, it's just seeing things like that, the, those stereotypes have to be changed for, through generations of educating and willfully trying to educate ourselves on change. Um, and maybe I answered your question, maybe I didn't, maybe I gave you some other information that may be helpful in a different world, but um, yeah, <laughs> I'm sorry, I'm sorry, coach. I'm sorry, coach, I didn't mean to kill your last name, Burl. Burrow. Okay, let me go up here. I'm, I'm missing some questions. I'm going to attack everyone. How do, how do you understand what racism is? Can Blacks be racist? Everybody has the capacity to be racist. Um, no matter what the argument it is within the Black community about you can't be racist because you don't have power, you can be racist to any community. Um, and me and Luis, we talked a little, about, a little bit about my trying to change almost my mindset on the word racism because the word hate is attached to racism all the time, but I feel like hate isn't a, 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 value, a valuable word attached to the word racism because I feel like to truly hate somebody, you have to know them. Um, and most of the individuals who are racist, they're just uneducated. So I feel like we have to attach the word ignorance to racism way more than we have to attach the word hatred because true hatred is to know somebody, to know their individual person, their being, and then you can you can loathe them, right? Um, but yes, I do think any individual in this world has the capacity to be uneducated about somebody and judge them, which really what I think racism is at the end of the day. Let me scroll down right here. Let me get, why does it always go to the top when I wanna to scroll? All right. Can I describe what equal looks like? Ooh, and that's from, that's from Coach Jay Burrow. Um, equal, equal in workspaces for everybody, right? We're not just talking about black people here because there's, we got workspaces. Women aren't treated correctly in workspaces. There's so, so many different things, um, different little niches. Um, equal looks like everybody getting treated the same, equality, simple. I think it's a, I, I think I'm trying to over explain something that can be simply explained. It's equal for everybody, equality. Everybody gets the same chances. Um, nobody comes out of college, no matter what their degree is, and gets into a job workspace, and just based off their skin, they get this job. Just based off their gender, they get this job. Equal. If I have qualifications that match this person, or if my qualifications, if I'm a woman, if they're higher than a man's, then I sh I'm more qualified for the job. If I'm homosexual and I, I have better qualifications than somebody who's heterosexual, I should still get the job. I shouldn't have, shouldn't be judgments against somebody, if that makes sense. If I can, if I attack that, just let me know if I did or not. Um, from Barbara, I signed you up earlier. Barbara, how you doing? Are you aware of any monitoring programs where families help develop stronger families? Ooh, I'm not. I'm not aware. That is, that's actually a great proposition. It'd be cool to see if we had something like that. Um, you know, having examples of black families in America, um, you know, maybe going and having play dates with other black families and maybe, you know, showing them, you know, a different side of what a black family can look like, a strong black family, a developed black family. Um, and also it, it takes the, the education side, right? Having the father in the household, but still, um, I don't know of anything like that personally. Um, I wish we wish I did. That that's that's a great idea you proposed there, though, Barbara. I, I think that would be a great program to open up across nationwide, having more representation of the black family. Um, 
the the whole black family, which is the biggest piece, is having the whole black family, the father, the, the, the wife, and the kids, right? Um, but yeah, I, I, I can't tell you, I couldn't tell you of, of any, personally. All right, do we have any more questions? Because I, like, I want to keep answering them. I want somebody to talk who hasn't said anything yet. Please get comfortable with uncomfortableness. Who are my heroes? This woman right here. That's my hero. That's one of them. Um, also, you know, um, I'm really big into, um, I don't know if y'all have heard of Sean King. He's a, he's a very outspoken individual on social media right now. Um, he's gone through a lot of plights in his life. He's, he's actually being, he's had death threats thrown at him right now, but seeing a man so strong for so long, he's been doing this for years, years. He's a very big social activist. Um, you know, 3 million followers on social media. Um, but he, he's definitely somebody that's, I can consider my mentor. Um, also, a preacher by the name of Eric Thomas. He goes by the hip hop preacher. Um, I, I get to learn a lot from him because he's gone through experiences where he, it took him 12 years to get a four year degree, just a little background on him. Um, so, and throughout his time being in school, he was homeless. Um, he lived in Detroit, grew up in Detroit. Um, and just seeing a man like that who completely flipped his life around. Now he's, a, he's an outspoken, he's probably the best public speaker in the, in the world right now. But um, I, I find finding that confidence in your vulnerability is something that has attracted me to him and Sean King and my mother is over time, they've got comfortable with being vulnerable. If that makes sense. Um, what was my experience of discrimination? What was your experience of discrimination at SOU? Mm. Hmm. At Southern Oregon University, I will say they are very good with trying to keep the school and the university diverse. Um, maybe I've had discrimination because of how I look, not necessarily my race. Um, but I, I can't specifically off the top of my head think of just times I was discriminated against just because of who I was at Southern Oregon University. Um, in the Southern Oregon Valley, that's a different thing. The Rogue Valley is a different thing. I, I can walk around here and get dirty looks and, you know, uh, waiters take longer to serve me, you know, and I notice it happening a lot. But um, yeah, I, I can't specifically point out a time at Southern Oregon University as a school that I was discriminated against just off the top of my head, just being honest with you. Um, and this one is another one from Ashton YMCA. I don't know who's typing those up, but I love it. Um, one of my favorite Martin Luther King quotes is, it's not the words our enemies, it's not the words of our enemies that we will remember, but the silence of our friends. And just summarizing that quote, obviously it's, Silence is violence. Um, if you choose to be quiet in a time like this, just like times you may have grown up and been silent around friend groups and stuff, allowing them to talk negatively about groups, if you choose to be silent, you're aligning with the side of the oppressor. So you have to speak out when times of injustice are around you. If you see somebody talking crazy about somebody just based off their person, say something, speak up. Don't be silent, no matter how uncomfortable it may be, no matter how you feel like you're gonna get beat up, get in a fight with the person, it does not matter. You have, to, you have to speak out for things that aren't right. You have to speak out against things that aren't right, um, which I think is really what Martin Luther King said in that quote. Um, let me see down here. Yes, admit, come on in here. Everybody come join us. Let's see what we got here. I liked your saying, what you said is offensive to me. I like I liked your saying what you said is offensive me. I also wonder if explaining why it would help educated increase awareness what do you think. I'm trying to understand what you wrote there, Jane. I liked your saying what you said is offensive to me. Oh, you're talking about what I said earlier. It's offensive to me. Just because it's not offensive to you doesn't mean it's not offensive. I think that's maybe what you're talking about. 
And I was also wondering if you, if explaining why it would help educated and increased awareness, why it would help to, ed to educate and increase awareness is what I'm trying to see if that's what you're saying there. Um, why I think education and awareness would change is because that overall, I think those two things is what shapes the social construct we live in. Everybody in this world only knows what they know and we learn from the generations before us. We learn everything from people before us. Nothing we know is original, to be so honest with you. There's no innovators out here. Everybody's learning something from somebody, taking pieces from everybody. So if we take time to educate our youth, which is the next generation, then we can force change within the future generations over time. And the education aspect is hard too because you look at our school curriculums and they're not, they do not have proper representation of, of black individuals in this world and the, the things that we've done for the world. Um, so the education aspect, education itself, the, the curriculum has to change, um, the, the mindset of the teachers has to change, then we can truly create young individuals in this world that are truly aligned with the message that want to educate people, that want equality for all, that want to, to push for a better life in general. You know, we want everybody to be comfortable in the world that we live in. Um, and I think that alone, the education piece, will then increase awareness because um, we're going to have more conscious individuals in this world, more empathetic individuals in this world, and then it will force change, if that makes sense. It will force awareness within the world. Um, let me go up here, because Michelle Mitchell said something. Okay, what would you get? Oregon's territorial constitution adopted in November, less than two years before it became a state, barred people of color from coming within its borders. There you go, Michelle. Um, it wasn't until 1926 that the provision was repeated, repealed. Oregon had imposed a tax on people of color in 1862 and racial exclusion laws and bans on interracial mar marriages were on books decades for decades. Wow. That kind of set a template for what many decades to come afterward forms the racial exclusion, anti-black hostility and housing. I think if, if y'all get a chance to read that comment by Michelle, she's, that was, that's so educated. It comes from just a, a historical standpoint on how Oregon itself, going back to Jane, I think, who, who wrote that original comment, right? Correct about Oregon being very white. Joyce, Joyce, who wrote that original comment, just going back to that, the, in places like this where it's very white, is where we can do, we can have the most impact, I think, in my opinion, um, because we have to change the mindsets of those who don't live through that experience. And in areas like this, we have a very good opportunity to do something. Like today, what I'm getting opportunity to do, being able to educate people, is what's going to create that change. And that's, that's doubly attacking Jane's question and Joyce's. Um, Robert says, what are some ways to address issues that are muddled, muddied by politics? For example, Colin Kaepernick kneeling in support of Black Lives Matter, people saying that's un-American, supporting military, et cetera. What are some ways we can address issues that are muddled, muddied by politics? <clears throat> oh, that's hard because it's, it's everything that we, we try to address is also just pushed down by media. And I feel like I keep having to go back to the same points, but that's really what I think this conversation is, we're gonna get out of it, is that it's gonna take the same thing over and over again to change. We have to keep educating and reminding people that this is wrong, what you're saying is wrong. Um, no, matter what it, no matter what you have to say, like, like you said, you pointed out Colin Kaepernick's kneeling in support for Black Lives Matter. We have our military, which you pointed out there too, our military hands the flags to those whose family members have deceased on a knee. You know, we, we, we propose to people on a knee. Taking a knee is not disrespectful and it's not un-American and it has nothing to do with the military here. 
Um, and we can talk about, we could have another talk and talk about blacks and military later. That's a whole different thing. So, but the change has to come from just continually educating people, no matter how, how ignorant they are and how prideful they are in their ignorance, you have to keep telling them, no, you're wrong. You're hundred percent wrong. You have, you have to, because we're fighting for equality. We're fighting for change. And if we keep letting these negative mindsets come in and muddy the water that we're going through, and we, we just give up, then the change will happen, right? Because it's been so long that people have just, they've tried to say something that it was just continually being pushed down. We have to keep going. This is going to get tiring. Let's keep going. <laughs> we, it don't stop now. Don't worry, James. Sorry for my bad type. I meant if I hear why what I said is offensive, then I can understand on the spot and it would op open up communication. There you go. Okay, thank you, Jane. Thank you, Jane. I don't know if I tapped into that when I was talking about that. Um, and then Brian Sander uh, posts some more uh, historical information. Oregon was uh, one of just six, six states that refused to ratify the 15th Amendment, which gave black men the right to vote. Oregon did not ratify the 15th Amendment until 1959. 1959. I guarantee there's at least 20 people in here that were born before 1959. So when we talk about how this, this stuff is systemic and it still exists around today, it's not that old, right? We have, I have people my age who are like, oh, that stuff was so long ago. Uh, slavery was so long ago. Like that's what we're talking about. We're talking about racism, <laughs> not just slavery. Um, these type of things ha exist, right? KKK marched in Grants Pass July 4th until 1952. So I think I'm, I think my point is kind of just being surmised to that we have to keep educating people that this stuff is still apparent today, today. The same folks who marched in these white robes and KKK once they take those robes off, they go right back to being our teachers, our judges, our, our bosses. You know what I mean? There's, there's so much, we have to attack the root and not the fruit. What we're focusing on is this little simple stuff, but to educate ourselves over time, continue to keep focusing that this, it's deeper than what people try to look at. Because the media is gonna show you this, media is gonna show you this, but there's a whole circus going on over here, like we all know. Let me go up here. Let me go up here. I'm getting some questions and I'm talking and I'm forgetting what to read. Okay. I grew up homeschooled and this is from Anna Edmondson. I grew up homeschooled in rural Maine, which is a very non-diverse community. I feel like there's a lot of other folks experiencing what I'm, I'm experiences that I'm ignorant of. And I feel like I can be better ally through better understanding of those experiences. Do you recommend resources for educating myself for better understanding of black history, culture, uh, thank you for speaking to us today. Um, and I will recommend a book by Tanasi Coates, um, and it's called Colorblindness. Um, or no, excuse me, it's, it talks about colorblindness. It's called Between the World and Me by Tanahasi Coates, Between the World and Me. Um, and the book basically just talks about colorblind, literally, because we've talked about colorblindness over these past few weeks. You can't just be you can't just say, I don't see color. You know, you, you obviously see color. We, we obviously see color in this world. And we have to understand that people based on their skin color go through different experiences. And that book right there, for me, and I read that my freshman year of college, and I'm graduated now. But that book for me was one of the most transformative books for me because being biracial, I sometimes, I didn't understand why my white counterparts didn't understand how, how, how I understood. And it allowed me to explain to other individuals what, what they're saying is implicit bias. Like you're choosing not to educate yourself on all these people around you and how they live a different experience. So I definitely appreciate you sharing your experience and being vulnerable to say that you don't know some stuff. Um, and I, I thank you for being in the conversation today, Anna. I really do. Uh, we got Barbara down here with the next question. And she says, I support monitoring programs as I am ja of Japanese descent, born during World War II, um, a very young lady. 
I have become the person I am because I have, because of the help and encouragement from friends, their families, coworkers, and colleagues and bosses. Uh, mentor, it's not monitoring. I'm saying, I'm not even saying monitoring. It's mentoring. Uh, mentoring helps us try to be resilient, uh, be resilient, happy, and successful. Let's create those opportunities for all. Absolutely, Barbara. Absolutely. You have to find, like, like I pointed out, you have to find a mentor, somebody that you can see yourself being in the future. And I think having mentoring programs within the Black community would be such a great thing to have. Um, you know, showing Black women, Black men, an individual that looks like them. And that's why, you know, I, 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 didn't, want, I didn't say I want to get political, but I want to talk about just a, having Barack Obama and Michelle Obama as our, our president and our first lady was just a great representation for Black people in this country, that you can become something, you can be this, you can have this family. They were, they were essentially mentors for Black people across the country and, and other individuals, obviously, because they're great people. But um, just being Black and seeing somebody like that, who acts like that, who carries himself like that, is great, absolutely. Let me scroll down here to Louise. Have you ever experienced physical violence because of being Black? Um, I've been jumped before by um, groups of white males. Um, yes, I have experienced violence. Um, I've been beat up being black. Um, more so it's because of uh, I, when I, after I did get beat up, I chose to take the time to grow myself. So now, now over these past few years, it's been, it just became more of verbal abuse. So or verbal violence, um, just because I, I portray myself this way now. But I have, when I was younger, I did get beat up. I got called the N-word multiple times to my face, um, you know, swollen lips, all types of stuff, you know. But those are the type of things that made me stronger, made me want to fight for things like this. Um, absolutely, Barbara. Absolutely, Anna. Um, Louise says, Ashton Public Library, for anybody who wants some resources, they have an excellent list of resources and topics. Um, so if you want to go check out Ashton Library, uh, I'm sure you go to the front desk there and find a good amount of resources for yourself, just to, you know, maybe push some more education out there in the world. Vicky says, Vicky Bon Bon says, can white elderly, can a white elderly effectively mentor a black youngster? Yeah, absolutely. 100%. Uh, maybe not in the same ways in some, you know, maybe pointing out some experiences, just being black and trying to understand your skin tone in the world. Um, but you, anybody can learn from anybody. It does not matter who you are. If you, if you think you can't learn from somebody based off your, their skin color, because you're a certain skin color, then that's another bias. Um, but anybody can learn from anybody. I've had mentors uh, growing up that were, weren't the same skin color as me. Um, but we're just stand-up individuals. I can talk about Coach Howard for just a second here, um, who, for me, and I never met him, but coming out here to Southern Oregon University, I got to see the impact that he placed on Black individuals' lives that played on the football team with me, white individuals' lives who played on the football team with me, and he's a white, he was a white man himself. But getting to see the impact from that and how he's changed my life Anybody can learn from anybody. I promise you that. It does not matter. You don't have to be the same skin color as anybody. You just have to show character, strength, and honor to people. And it, you, you can change people's life just through things like that. Robert says, what are some of the ways we can keep individuals or influence or power accountable and hold them accountable for their actions? Um, an example being the bad apple officer, officers responsible for the deaths of people of color. Um, we have to get rid of qualified immunity, simple as it goes. Um, police officers aren't, haven't been held accountable in this, this nation for a long time just based off of the, the uh, job that they have. We have to get rid of the fact that the saying that, okay, he's a police officer, uh, he's, he's exempt from being arrested. We have to get rid of qualified immunity, simple as it goes. Like these, these killers of Breonna Taylor, just to say a name, that are still not arrested to this day, that some of them are still out here living their free lives, they need to be arrested. Simple as it goes. All right, I think that, is that our time?
I have one minute. Yes. <laughs> you want to fit one question in one minute? Anybody got one? Thank you, Vicki. I'm great. Absolutely great, Robert. Every day I wake up above the ground, I'm great. Um, I have an underlying layer of obviously anger that comes along with living, but it's not angry to distance people that me and Lou, like what me and Louise talked about earlier. Um, it's an anger to want to change. I want to change the world. Uh, I'm antsy to change the world and I, I will. It's a promise. <laughs>